Uh, okay, so let's get started. I've already done the introduction. I have two sheets for everyone here. Uh, I guess pass them around if you wouldn't mind. So welcome to Graduate Thermodynamics. Just pass around the syllabus. I'll kind of go over some of the logistics uh, and sort of philosophy behind how I like to run the class uh, before we jump into the aggressive content. And today's a pretty mild day, so no, no stress on that one. Okay, so in the syllabus, I said, you guys all got my email on Canvas. Do you guys have access to Canvas yet? Yeah. Have everyone, everyone's got that all sorted out? Okay, so in the message, what I tried to convey, uh, there are two textbooks that I sort of require, I suppose. Um, I don't ask questions out of the book, so I don't say do question 7.2 or whatever the case is. If there's a question that I get from a book, I'll just transcribe it or something like that. Uh, so no one has to rely on the book itself for any of the exact problems. But due to the nature of how I teach the class, it is kind of important to have two separate textbooks. Uh, so the one that I have listed on the syllabus is this one here by uh, Stanley Sandler. He's a professor at the University of Delaware. Uh, this is probably the single most comprehensive undergraduate chemical engineering textbook. As you can see, it is relatively comprehensive in its size. Uh, it is, in many ways, um, who uses books in undergraduate? Anyone? So it's kind of an aggressive undergrad text or an easy grad level text. Uh, so it derives everything from very basic first principles. For example, Routes Law is introduced in chapter 10, right? So we go through the entire formulation of thermodynamics, which is basically what we're we'll doing the same in this class as well. So we're going to go from assuming you guys know nothing about thermodynamics, and today we'll actually be talking about just the history of the development of thermodynamics, more or less. Actually, specifically the history of the development of the first law. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the development of the second law. There is a newer edition, the fifth edition. Um, they send it to me in a floppy uh, paperback form. Either one of these would be good. But if you have an undergraduate text that uh, is relatively comprehensive, approaches undergrad thermo or continuum classical thermo from a really rigorous mathematical perspective, then that should be relatively okay. So I think Smith, Van Ness, and Abbott is a really common one. That one should probably be fine, so long as you're familiar with it. Uh, but this one here, I think, is a very, very good text, and it's a good reference one. Now, the second book is this one here, uh, Introduction to Applied Statistical Thermodynamics. So a lot of graduate level chemical engineering thermodynamic classes across the country don't teach thermo, they teach statmec, st statistical mechanics, and I always stumble when I say that. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's the best approach. The assumption there is that everyone walks into the class with a really strong foundation in undergrad thermo to start off with. And I feel like a lot of people doesn't really click 100% uh, when they take thermo for the first time. So instead what we'd like to do is I like to cover really comprehensively rederiving everything, giving everyone an extremely solid foundation for classical or continuum thermodynamics, specifically with an emphasis on phase equilibria, solid liquid vapor liquid, um, liquid liquid equilibrium, because that's mostly what chemical engineers worry about when it comes to uh, phase equilibria. If you want to design a, a boiler or a refrigeration cycle or a power generation cycle, you're much better suited going with a mechanical engineer. So we don't spend a tremendous amount of time talking about the details of cycles other than helping us you know, practice energy balances. So most all of our emphasis is going to be on phase equilibria and reaction equilibria, which is really the core emphasis of Kenny. Uh, but this book here gives us an introduction to STATMEC. Uh, it's written in a very user-friendly approach, so it kind of gives everyone a, a comprehensive foundation to build on, as opposed to going to really aggressive uh, physical chemistry type textbooks for that purpose. Uh, so you've got time. We're going to start that sort of the last half to last third of the semester. We'll be talking about this. Um, we have a TA. It is Chinmay back there. Uh, he took the class two years ago? 16. 2000, so yeah, two, two years ago. So you are in very good hands. Uh, I'll be sending out a Doodle poll or whatever Google Forms poll, whatever works out the best to decide on office hours uh, so that we can everyone have uh, time to ask as many questions as necessary for help. Okay, 
let's go through this, run through the syllabus really quickly. So we've already gone through more or less the first half of the first page. Course website, I'll be posting all the homework. Uh, we'll be doing our grading probably electronically. Well, no, we can do paper grading for this, but we'll have to do one electronic uh, for the distance. So all the homework, all the exam resources, all my communication, all of everything is going to go through Canvas. I don't use hardly any Canvas's features. All I do is I upload stuff in the files section. So if you go to the files section, that's where I put everything. That's where I put practice exams, homework solutions, homework problems, handouts, everything goes there. Uh, so I've done this recording job several times previously. Uh, 2016, we had a number of distant students this Kaltura link, this is where um, a guy filmed every class in the back corner, kind of panned across. I know there's pros and cons to each approach. This one here, you get to see the entire chalkboard at once, but the downside is that it's kind of small writing. Um, but I record it in uh, full 1080p, uh, so hopefully if you view it on a relatively large um, computer screen, hopefully you, you guys have reasonable, you're not working on like a nine inch laptop, I don't think they make those anymore. Uh, but you should hopefully be able to see things reasonably well, so long as there's not weird reflections from the, the whiteboard. Uh, so last year, okay, so 2016, we had a guy with a camera in the back. Last year, I had a screen capture app where I wrote on the app and then it projected onto the screen. So it's just my voice and a black chalkboard with writing. And then this year, we're trying this approach here with the iPad camera capturing me and the whole screen and we'll see, so you should have all sources of resources. So if one of these fails, we'll rely on one of those other two previous years. They might not exactly line up, but you'll be able, you'll be able to piece it together reasonably well uh, based on the date and the content. Okay, uh, course objectives, you guys can read over that on your own. Uh, homework, so uh, homework are to be done individually, um, but of course you can work together on a group. I think it's really important. Uh, but the most important thing is that I want everyone to learn in this class. So as this is a graduate level class, your, for most of you who are in the PhD program, um, I have never, never been asked what my GPA was in graduate school. Not once. Nobody cares. The only criteria for GPA in graduate school, especially for those who are in the PhD program, is to pass your qualifying exams. If your grades are good enough to pass your qualifying exams, once you go through to that point, you've got three to four more years of research work, and that is how you're going to get your next job. So the point of this class is not to jump through the hoops and get the A. The point of this class is to learn, get through your qualifying exams, and apply this material to your research. Because if you are a well-rounded PhD student, you will see sort of all the different facets of all the different core classes in any individual research project. So, uh, with that being said, don't try and uh, just you know, do what you can to get an A. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you do what you can to understand the content. Uh, so that's why I think uh, studying in a group is very important. However, you have to do your own work. You have to turn in your own assignments, all that jazz. Uh, no copying, no uh, academic uh, misconduct. Uh, we will accept late homework with the 50% penalty one week later. Um, but past that, you are out of luck. Homework is only going to amount to 15% of the grade, but I, I assure you if you do poorly on the homework, you will do poorly on the exams. Right? In, my, in my eyes, I will borrow a lot of homework problems potentially from previous years. I'll write a few new ones each time, but the main thing is that I choose those problems or I write those problems because I think they help develop competency in core areas that are important for the class. So if you don't do the homework, you don't understand the homework, you're going to bomb the exam. Because I write the exam new every time each year, so there's no way you can uh, sort of uh, skip that step. I do have two quizzes. If you look on the last page, uh, you can see the quizzes are kind of midway checkpoints in between the exams. The quizzes are there. They're not worth a tremendous amount. They're worth just enough to take them seriously. But the main point of the quizzes is to test your level of understanding before we get to the exams which if you do poorly on the exams will really hit you. Uh, so that's the point of the quizzes. Uh, they're, they're planned to be relatively short, uh, straightforward. I think uh, in the past I've only had them take about half the class. So it's just enough to, to really kind of force you to sit down, assess what you truly understand, and then focus your efforts on what areas you need to 
uh, more, more attention on because we will be going extremely quickly, right? So we're going to cover in more detail than an undergrad thermo class does, maybe in a four credit hour class in about six weeks. So we're going to go extremely quickly through the core material, uh, so it's important to keep track on, on where you're at. Uh, academic misconduct. Oh, there will be a, there will be a course a class project as well. That'll be done towards the end of the semester. I'm still working on the details of what to do with that one. Uh, grading. Uh, these are the. I, I won't be any harsher than this, uh, but likely those cutoffs will be lowered. I do have a regrade policy, uh, where if you think that we made a mistake on the grading, you basically have to hand back in the um, the assignment within one week of when we return it. Uh, so this is most important for exams. So if I hand back the exams on a Wednesday and you're not here, that's still when the clock starts. Uh, the goal with the regrade request is that you don't just say, oh, you graded wrong and hand it back to me. Right? You, I want you to write out a written description that basically says, this is where I think the error in judgment was. Because sometimes there's multiple ways to solve a problem and we may have overlooked your assumptions and it may be a relatively good solution. Right? So the idea then is you write a little description describing why you think your approach is reasonable and that you should take a look at it. And then in that description, basically you have to just uh, convince us that you have a good understanding of the problem. Um, and uh, one other uh, area that I always bring up, and the last thing before the uh, outline on the last page, uh, we have a section that says students with disabilities, right? I want this to be a fair fight for everyone in the class. So if you have testing anxiety, uh, you need a quiet room, whatever the case is, uh, there is a, a CDS, a Center for Disability Services is what it's called. Uh, they're in the student union. Um, I promise no one will uh, misjudge anyone or, or look down on anyone if they are going to get that additional assistance. But if you do have uh, some sort of a, a learning special consideration or whatever the case is, you know, don't, don't try and just sort of fight through it. If you do struggle with exams, uh, please go and give them a visit. If they say, nope, you seem fine, you'll be fine. But oftentimes they'll give time and a half or, or even in, in sort of severe cases, uh, you're twice the amount of time on an exam. Uh, the downside though is that it's more difficult to ask questions. So it's sort of a, a pro and con in that place. But uh, I do want everyone to have an equal opportunity to do well in this class, right? And I, I, don't, I will not uh, uh, judge anyone for, for taking advantage of those services. Uh, if they are necessary. Uh, so if you look at the rough outline, through about little after fall break is when we will wrap up our classical thermo. So chemical equilibrium that week of October 15th, we'll try and keep to the schedule. We usually fall a little bit behind. Uh, but the last about half to, you know, I don't know, two fifths of the class, we're covering statistical thermodynamics. Um, and it'll become more and more clear why that's the case. Okay, any questions on the syllabus? All right, this next sheet, this is your equation sheet. Now I may modify this or tweak this to some extent, uh, you know, optimize its, its packing structure, whatever. Uh, but this is a sheet that I have put together that you will get with every single exam, probably quizzes, I think. Uh, I don't remember if I gave it out with quizzes or not. But this is the entire class on one sheet of paper. My goal is to convince every single one of you that thermodynamics is boring and trivial and not complex at all. The entire class fits onto this one single page. With the majority of it, you know, a lot of this stuff right here, the top half is mostly just reference. Well, most of this is all just reference. But thermodynamics in itself is not a very complex material. It's not a very complex course. And that's my goal is to convince you that that is true. Uh, and so what, what I'd like to do uh, today is to go through the history and the formulation of thermodynamics uh, specifically to give a historical perspective of why thermo is a confusing class for most students when they see it for the first time. Because the thing you have to remember is that thermodynamics predates atomic theory. Right? We had an understanding of thermo before we had an understanding of what an atom was. So when, uh, you know, in the early 1900s and late 1800s, when atomic theory was starting to be formalized and we actually knew what the atom looked like, uh, 
The job then of statistical mechanics, where you had the concept of an atom, you had the concept of a particle, had to show that it gave the same predictions as classical thermo. Then when quantum mechanics came on in the 1920s and 30s, they had to prove that they got the same predictions as statistical mechanics and the same predictions as thermodynamics. So when we talk about terms such as internal energy and entropy, we don't have to define what that is exactly. All we need to know is that matter can store energy in some way, shape, or form. But we didn't know at the time that matter stored energy in the form of the velocity of the particles or in the rotation or the vibrations Right? We didn't know any of that. Internal energy is intentionally ambiguous and vague. And so as an undergraduate, right, it seemed like an arbitrarily confusing material that to teach you. Because you guys walk in with the knowledge of what a atom is, what the knowledge of what a chemical bond is, and with some knowledge of quantum mechanics and st statistical mechanics. See, I told you I always, I always get that one wrong. Uh, so that's why I like to go through and basically redo everything. But every once in a while, we're going to stop and remind ourselves, does this seem confusing? Does this seem arbitrary? And the answer is always yes. So classical thermodynamics. I don't like to think, so when we teach, when I teach thermo, I don't like to think that I'm teaching you sort of the answer to all the problems or the fundamental theory of everything. What most of everything you work with in thermodynamics, I'm teaching you the system. This is the system that has been established over the course of hundreds of years of research and study that seems to develop a way to answer important questions. But you can, in theory, reformulate all of thermodynamics again with a different type of system. Okay? So I'll be a little bit more clear what I mean here then. So <clears throat> thermodynamics, I'll call this thermo basics, or maybe thermo introduction. The core tenets of thermodynamics, I have basically on one sheet of notes right here, uh, can be boiled down that from, from one simple concept. The universe effectively has three variables for everything. We have U, which is internal energy, We have S, which is entropy, and we have volume, rather we'll call it specific volume with this little underbar underneath it to make it an intensive quantity. In theory, I guess we could put an underbar on all these ones too, but uh, this is basically what we call real space. real three-dimensional space, let's say. So everything in the universe has these three properties. Now this is something that's not typically covered very clearly. From this basic assumption that the universe can be described by three properties, we implicitly get the Gibbs phase rule. What I mean by this is if we have an equation that relates U, S, and V, which is effectively the goal of what we're trying to accomplish in this class is to define these equations. If you have three, these three variables and an equation that relates all of them, you can only define two of the three relationships. The third one is defined by that equation or that relationship. So the Gibbs phase rule is that means we only have to define two variables to fully understand all of the properties of matter. So because we're saying that the, any piece of matter in the universe can be defined by these three variables, we only need to define two of them if we have those laws and relationships that relate between the two of them. Next, we have the first law. In this case here, we define the first law as the rate of change in internal energy being equal to the differential amount of heat and the differential amount, differential amount of work going into the system. And this is quite simply just the law of conservation of energy. 
The first law of thermodynamics is no more complex than just not breaking the rule of saying you're not creating or destroying energy. Now, there's a slightly different notation here. We have a D, meaning a definite integral for the U, whereas we put these uh, kind of uh, fancy differentials that we typically see with partials for the Q and the W. Now, the reason behind this is that we can write U as equal to the integral of DU going from some state one to some state two. But we cannot say that Q is equal to the same thing. Right? Because the heat and work that are required to perform a particular process are dependent on the path. So we can't just do this sort of quick thermo math. Now thermo math is a lot of fun. It's really easy and it's really sloppy. Because we just say state one and state two. We don't care how we get to those points. And so we can just convert du's into u's just by integrating them. So it's nice and convenient. So we use a slightly different notation for the u, which is a state function, which we'll talk more about, versus the q and the w, and that's the purpose behind it. Okay, next, we have the second law. <coughs> and we'll spend all day on Wednesday talking about the second law of thermodynamics, uh, because it's uh, far and away probably the more important of the two laws. That doesn't get the attention it deserves, uh, because it's really a fascinating um, a law. Uh, so, the second law of thermodynamics is not what you see on the equation sheet. So the equation sheet, uh, you always see this, and it drives me crazy. Uh, you always have the second law written in a thermo textbook, and it just kind of spits it out like this. Let's say Q dot over T plus S dot gen. Right, this is for a closed system. We'll talk about where this form comes from. Right? It's something that's always skipped over, and I really haven't seen any good thermotexts that, that actually describe uh, where this relationship comes from. So we're not going to start at this point. Right? That is too advanced for what we want to start off with, introducing the second law. Rather, we want to focus on the core premise of the properties of entropy itself. So the second law, I'm going to write it out in actually several different steps, because all of the different components are critical to our understanding of thermodynamics. So the main starting point is that the rate of change of entropy for any real process always has to increase or at least stay constant. In the real world, it'll never stay constant. You can never have a truly reversible process. A truly reversible process takes an infinite amount of time. Because any gradient that you have in the system, gradients always cause either heat diffusion or mass diffusion, which are irreversible processes. As soon as something diffuses out, it'll never reconcentrate. So in order to have something that is truly reversible, you have to do it in a system with no gradients. Well, if it has no gradients, then how do you transfer heat? How do you transfer mass? How do you transfer momentum? It's really not a feasible scenario to consider, unless you stretch it out for infinite time. So in, in that case, you can never really get it reversible, but you can asymptotically approach it being reversible. And this is typically where we stop when it comes to the second law. But we have a few more things that I like to add on. Next that entropy is always uh, what's the term? concave. It always has a negative slope. So if you look at the properties of entropy as a function of anything, it could be pressure, temperature, uh, density, internal energy, whatever the variable is, any single variable, it'll always have a curved shape like this. And this is because of the last tenet, which is that at equilibrium, ds is equal to zero. And this is kind of generally true for everything. At equilibrium, nothing can be changing. So all differentials have to be zero at equilibrium. So the rate of change of entropy in the system, how much entropy is in, in a sort of whatever last that we draw around and call system, has to be equal to zero. So what this means is that entropy is a maximum at equilibrium. So if we didn't have this criteria, we could in theory potentially have a curve of entropy that looked like this. And we could say, ah, that is equilibrium. But this would result, unfortunately, in what we call an unstable universe. Everything would catastrophically explode because 
If every single process has to create entropy, the problem is if you have a curvature of entropy like this, any small perturbation, a bond vibrating a little bit differently, a molecule rotating, right, uh, something gets knocked over, that would increase entropy. And then as soon as you have any small microscopic, macroscopic, any perturbation whatsoever, everything would cascade and change. So in order for the universe to be stable, you have to have entropy be a concave function. Now from this, we can get a lot of other really interesting uh, properties. We know that heat capacity has to be greater than zero. We know that this is an important relationship here for uh, working with gases. When I change the volume of a system, or so let's say I increase the pressure, it means I have to decrease the volume. So this relationship here, so the, if I change the volume of the system, how am I changing its pressure, for example? This always has to be less than zero, meaning that if we were to look at the ideal gas law, we have a PV relationship. What does it look like? As I, as I decrease the volume, what happens to my pressure? It increases. It increases. But what does, the, what does the curve look like? If you write out the ideal gas law, right? PV equals RT. So I would, I was, I'm, I'm really slow at this always. Right? So I always have to rewrite this. I always write P is equal to RT times 1 over V. It's a radical function. That's what it looks like. This. Entropy describes this process. From this, we also know that the Gibbs free energy, its curvature always has to be convex. And that temperature always has to be greater than zero. You can never have a negative temperature. All of this is a direct consequence of the curvature of the shape of entropy, which is not uh, very commonly discussed, which I think is interesting. Uh, not uh, super interesting, but just interesting. Okay, this is, this is the foundation of all thermo. Everything from this point is made up. Everything. So that's why I focus. We're not teaching the answers. I'm teaching the system. This is the system that has been established and developed that seems to be useful in order to build the society that we have right now. So I think there's a pretty good amount of certainty that what they're talking about makes a lot of sense. But this is the starting point. Everything beyond here, right, these are fundamental laws that we don't necessarily know the reason behind. We don't know what exactly is the foundation of entropy, but we know that it has never been disproven, right? So we know these things to be true. We can't fully describe them, but uh, they are not useful at all. Right? I don't have an internal energy meter. I can't go into a lab, stick a probe into something, and measure its internal energy. I don't hardly even know what entropy is. I know it's important. I can't measure it. So everything that we actually can measure is not on this board right here, save for one, which is the density. We can measure that one. But it's kind of a pain, actually. We'd much rather measure other things. So as chemical engineers, what are the two most important variables that we care the most about for a chemical process? that are not on this board. Pressure. pressure and temperature. So everything else, everything that we do, all the complexity of thermal, all of its arbitrariness, is basically to convert these core concepts into things that are actually useful for us to solve problems. So with that being said, temperature is not actually an innate property, right? It's a derived quantity. It wasn't until the late 1800s, when Boltzmann studied it, that we actually had a microscopic rationale for what temperature is. We know now that temperature relates to the kinetic energy of the gases of the molecules in the system. But back in the day, it was just hot. We didn't really know what caused temperature to be a certain case. So temperature is defined based on these variables here as the rate of change of entropy. Oops with respect to internal energy at constant volume. So what is the shape of the curve if I plotted entropy versus internal energy while holding the specific volume constant? Now a quick note, quick note and discussion about 
this formulation here. This looks familiar, right, from, from previous thermo classes? It, who, who, who hasn't seen, um, or say that, who has seen this type of notation in a previous thermo class? A few, okay. So, we'll be doing a lot of this type of calculus. So this is the partial derivative of entropy with respect to the internal energy while holding V constant. So, in thermo, this is just a convenience little notation. We don't really need to keep it there, but it's kind of a reminder of the system that we're working in. So when you take a partial derivative, everything is held constant save for these two variables. So since there are a finite number of variables in thermodynamics always, we just write this as a reminder to say uh, we're working at a constant volume system. Okay, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll be going over these a lot. Pressure is also a defined quantity. So I'm going to say V under bar is equal to, uh, this is the volume per, we'll call it, specific volume. And U under bar is the energy per mole. S under bar. And these are called the specific quantities, just to have a complete note. Pressure and temperature from classical thermodynamics are defined terms. They are defined based on their relationship to the first and second laws written over there in the other part of the board. So the true meaning of what pressure, what the, how pressure was generated, how, what does temperature mean, these things did not come until the 19th century, late 19th century. We were using thermodynamics in the 18th century, uh, so this is, you know, this predates atomic theory. So now we know what causes pressure, molecules bouncing off of a wall, but again, back in the day, we didn't know what it was. Now we also can define some convenience functions. These include enthalpy, sorry, three bars meaning uh, define, enthalpy, right? So we define this as U plus PV. Now, the reason why we define this is because this is very useful for open systems. There is no law that says we have to write enthalpy this way. Everything that we've done in thermodynamics, we could start from this point onwards here, the core tenets of thermo. But we define enthalpy because it's very, very useful. It's useful for open systems, it's useful for systems at constant pressure. We also define A as the Helmholtz energy. Oops, Helmholtz E. And we define G as the Gibbs energy. Define. This is U minus TS, and this is H minus TS. And these are useful for phase equilibria. The Helmholtz energy is very commonly used in liquid systems. So if I was only doing polymer melts, for example, or how a protein behaves in a certain fluid, I don't necessarily care about how the volume expansion changes things, right? Which is where the PV enters into the Gibbs free energy. So a lot of times if I read a, a thermodynamics paper that focuses on liquid behavior, they always use A, the Helmholtz energy. As chemical engineers, we typically see Gibbs free energy all the time. That's because we're more concerned with phase transitions across liquid vapor, because distillation is such a critical component of separations in the oil and gas industry and a lot of what we do as chemical engineers in the chemical industry. So because we do a lot of vapor-liquid equilibrium, we talk specifically about Gibbs. But if you're talking to someone who does more fundamental physics, 
they may concern themselves only with Helmholtz because they don't want to worry about the added complexity of the boundary volume changing. Right? So if you're considering only doing your experiments in a container of a fixed volume, or you don't care too much about the volume expansion, you don't want to add in the extra complexity of this PV term. So you keep it simple and you focus on the Helmholtz. So those are what those terms are useful for. So the goal of everything that we're going to be doing now is to take enthalpy, A, G, material properties, right? This includes the density, the thermal conductivity, isothermal compressibility, is we want to take terms that we can measure in the laboratory and make sure we don't violate the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Functions like enthalpy, Helmholtz, and Gibbs free energy help us to make sure that we don't break those rules. So that's why these are very useful. Now, as a reminder, this all came to be before uh, we had any concept of the atom. Right? So just always force yourself to remember that. And I, and I try to teach the class without relying on knowing what an atom is. And I think it helps unlock why thermo is formulated the way that it is and why it seems so abstract. Now, I will always bring in right, the modern understanding and say, now we know now that this is why it happens. But back in the day, this is the only thing they could use. So as confusing as quantum mechanics is to everyone, who's had a quantum class? Everything is abstract in quantum, right? The wave function is abstract. That's what this was to researchers of the 17th and 18th and 19th century, right? They didn't know how these things were actually physically stored, so they had to trust the math. And that's why, you know, the math was very effective, more or less for optimizing steam engines during the Industrial Revolution, but it was super effective at predicting those properties, so they just trusted the math and left it, left it at that. Okay, so now uh, we'll have to carry this on maybe a little bit on Wednesday, but a little bit too verbose, but I'd like to go through a really quick history of the development of more or less uh, the foundations of uh, thermodynamics. I'll try and give a little truncated one here so we can get through all of it. Okay, so history of thermo. The first core concept here dates back to 1774. Rather, that's not true. Uh, I have one that's a little bit older than this. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about the law of conservation of mass. So I'll just write this as mass conservation. Now this, 1774, we have Anton Lavoisier, French chemist, I guess, maybe, or physicist, I don't know what you want to call it. So what he did uh, is he took a, a piece of diamond, right? And they still had an idea of what, um, what elements were back in those days, right? But they didn't exactly know what that meant to be a unique element. Right, so they knew that they had diamond, which was pure carbon. Carbon had already been discovered. So Lavoisier burnt a diamond in pure oxygen because he knew that that would develop pure CO2. Well, we know now, right, of course, that there's an atom of carbon, this kind of stuff, blah, 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 and it burns and everything. So they knew what atoms were. They didn't know what atoms were. They knew what elements were. Uh, and he found that this mass 1 is equal to mass 2 effectively stating that you cannot create or destroy mass. We know now that we can uh, through atomic processes, but uh, we don't consider that whatsoever. In our world, there are no nuclear reactions for this development of thermo. Uh, so we can use this information, and we'll write out this sort of core concept in a form that we typically see as chemical engineers, where if we have a particular chemical process, the rate of change of mass in the system, that's what this means. So if I have a box with streams coming in and streams coming out, the system that we like to describe is whatever we would like to draw a dotted line around. So in this case, it's uh, some sort of a chemical process or a box. It could be a heat exchanger, 
could be a reactor, this box could be an entire chemical plant, or this box could be planet Earth. Whatever we want to call the system, we can call the system, and these laws will hold true. So how we write this out in modern times is we write the summation of the flow rates of the mass in minus the summation of the flow rates of mass out, and this is what we call the differential form. The differential form of the mass balance equation. So we're keeping track of the rate that stuff comes in and out of the system. Now we also have the integral form, where we look at the mass of the system at some time 2, minus the mass of the system at some time 1. And this is effectively exactly the same form, except we just slap an integral on it. Oops. D, T, minus summation. We typically use the differential form for open systems, and we typically use the integral form for closed systems. For open systems, the reason why we like the differential form is because oftentimes we say that this goes to zero. Makes it easy. If we keep things steady state, the same rate going in, the same rate going out, it simplifies processes. For the integral form, we usually care or know about the initial and final conditions and we're trying to figure out what's going on. So what we care about is the total amount of mass coming into the system with the total amount of mass coming out of the system. Or rather, we won't focus too much on the material balance side. We'll focus more so on the total amount of energy going into the system or the total amount of entropy being generated in the system. So the integral form is useful for closed. This is typically what we use for open systems because for most all open systems, we assume that this goes to zero because it'll be steady state. All right, the next core concept, Lavoisier kind of nailed that one, so there wasn't too much debate. Next one is the law of conservation of energy. This is a little bit more interesting. Well, no, the first law is more interesting. This one's pretty straightforward. Too. Law of conservation of energy. Uh, goes back to 1638 by Galileo. Uh, and so with this, he did this with a pendulum experiment. So if we have a pendulum, it starts off swinging high, eventually it uh, reaches the bottom, going a particular direction, swings back out the other way, and swings back heading the opposite direction. So if we plot out the total energy as a function of time in this particular system, it will be constant. But what is happening is that we are exchanging in between potential energy, rather gravitational potential energy, and kinetic energy. So in this case it's going to be a sinusoidal curve we're going to start off with all potential energy. We're going to go down to no potential energy. Go back up to full potential energy. And back down there. So this is our potential energy. Then we're going to have our kinetic energy. And we basically have a flawless transition between kinetic and potential energy. So this one was pretty well understood. Right, that you could lift something up and you could drop it. So Galileo originally tried to do this with a, uh, a curved surface and a ball that was rolling back and forth, uh, but found that there was too much friction, so eventually the optimized experimental design was the heavy weight on a pendulum. Okay, now the tricky part comes in. Defining the first law of thermodynamics. So the history of the first law, uh, it took a while to get it to the form that we use right now. So I first like to talk about uh, sort of bad theories of thermodynamics.
So this is the first law history. So there was a theory in the mid-1800s called caloric theory. So the idea behind caloric theory was that caloric was a gas, uh, was a massless gas that carried heat. So from this, cold was the absence of caloric. So if something was cold, it didn't have as much caloric as something that was hot. But the key thing here, and then heat is obviously the opposite of that, the key thing here, um, according to caloric theory, was that caloric was conserved. Meaning you cannot generate or consume caloric. There was a finite amount of heat in the universe. And so you took it from one object and you gave it to another, and then you've transferred caloric from one to the other. We know now that obviously to be false, otherwise the second law really wouldn't be a thing, right? The idea behind caloric theory, right, is that caloric was conserved. Um, but those of you who ever played was it Cards Against Humanity? There's one of the cards that says the heat death of the universe. Eventually, all useful work will be converted to heat or so the second law would predict. Uh, so we know that we can easily generate heat. But it wasn't very clear back in those days. So in 1978, sorry, 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 1798, <laughs> uh, this is where we had an individual named Count Rumford. He was in, uh, I guess it was maybe Prussia back then. So Count Rumford worked at a a cannon manufacturing company, I guess is what you'd call it, right? They made cannons. So how they did that is they had a big chunk of metal and they would bore out the center of it to make room for the cannonball. So what he did in his experiments, these are, um, I don't know, a little bit cowboy type experiments. He had a cannon submerged in water so that it did not overheat. This was their manufacturing strategy. And they had a metal bore, basically a, a sort of a ball with some blades on it that kind of ground into the metal. And this would be spinning around and they would just bore it out. So what he had found is that in doing uh, this process here, they could boil the water for this particular cannon bore setup in approximately 2.5 hours from starting the process. But what else he found is that if he continued to bore out the cannon, he could get the water to continuously boil. The reason why this is so significant is if he can get it to continuously boil, where is the caloric coming from? He is not transferring caloric from one item to another. He is somehow spontaneously creating caloric. Right? So this is sort of the first falling point of caloric theory. But I will say one other thing. Uh, caloric theory was not unuseful. So the uh, Carnot cycle was derived with caloric theory. So that's also probably why we don't study Joule's, or sorry, no, uh, not Carnot's original uh, derivation is because it's all based on a false premise. Right? So the Carnot cycle was derived based on caloric theory. So it's not terrible. But the problem is, this is not exactly the most well-designed, controlled laboratory environment. So this work was largely not recognized or considered until uh, James Prescott Joule came along in approximately 1840. I think Joule was British. Uh, so what he did, uh, is he more or less repeated similar experiments, not with the cannon boring out, but using a similar concept. What he wanted to look at was the relationship between internal energy and kinetic, electric, uh, uh, all sorts of different forms of energy and work. Uh, so his original work 
was heating by viscous dissipation. V I C O U S. Meaning that he had an apparatus that was two reservoirs that were connected by a small channel and then flushing the fluid back and forth by pushing on the different sides and rocking it back and forth. And from this, they knew how much work was being pushed down on either end and then monitored the temperature increase of the water. This is a much more controlled experiment. He additionally repeated the same experiment using electric heaters, right, by putting enough a known quantity of electrical heat into the system and also by doing the same approach by pressurizing a gas. So, Joule is more or less credited as the sort of I guess, founding father of the first law of thermodynamics, but there were sort of earlier indications of that. <coughs> okay. Um, and that's where we get to the sort of modern form of the first law. Now, I'm going to go just a few minutes over, I'm sorry, to give a quick overview of where we were at in terms of atomic theory. 1840, pretty well locked in with the first law of thermodynamics. At 1805, this is atomic theory, so I want to have a parallel timeline. So atomic theory, we have 1805, this is John Dalton. John Dalton. He found that certain elements are always present in the same ratios. Now, this is basically more or less saying H2O. Every time they purified water into its original elements by electrolysis, they always got the same ratio of hydrogen produced to the same ratio of oxygen produced. So Dalton used this information to presume the existence of an atom. Now, I'm not considering the ancient Greek stuff where they say, oh, atom has to be indivisible. This is actually real sort of concrete evidence, not just philosophy. Ludwig Boltzmann. This is in 19, let's see, you know, let's see, I don't know, where is this? 18, 1871. So Ludwig Boltzmann is largely credited with the first concrete solid evidence of not only atomic theory, but also an estimate of the size of the atom, uh, the energy of an atom. And from this, um, Boltzmann is well known for the kinetic theory of gases. And this is when he developed it in 1871. So with the Boltzmann constant here, Kb, this is the uh, proportionality relationship between the velocity of a gas and its energy, a single atom. So in this case, the Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. That is the energy of a gas particle based on its temperature. So this gives us the first real insight as to what temperature actually means. And it's an extremely, extremely, extremely small number. So people didn't believe him, right? So Ludwig Boltzmann had it right. He nailed it, more or less. But critics of the time said, oh, no, this is just a mathematical construct. It's very useful because he could actually predict the properties of superheated steam that nobody else could using his kinetic theory of gases. But no one believed it. They all thought it was just a trick, a mathematical trick, more or less. And just so, we're, just so everyone's clear, the uh, uh, gas constant is just Avogadro's number times by the Boltzmann constant. So the gas constant, all it is is a proportionality relationship between how much energy a gas has based on its kinetic motion. That's what the gas constant is. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Boltzmann committed suicide in 1906 because nobody believed him more or less, and I'm sure it wasn't the only reason. Uh, but if he was more up to date in literature in 1905, Einstein demonstrated the Brownian motion could be described by very, 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 very small atoms undergoing random fluctuation. And he applied Boltzmann's concept of an atom. 
using the kinetic theory of gases to mathematically describe Brownian motion only one year prior. So apparently he wasn't reading the literature, lesson to everyone. And then in 1908, this sealed the deal. A French physicist named Jean Perrin, hopefully no one speaks French and critiques my, my accent, uh, he measured Avogadro's number accurately with Brownian motion. And at that point, the fate was sealed atomic theory was true and valid. 1908. Mind-boggling how recent it was. Right now, this is just locking in that we actually have atoms, and we generally know what size the atoms are. Locked in in 1908. Now, uh, a couple of other notes, they don't have a lot of time to go through, but basically, 1889, is when J.J. Uh, Thompson discovered the electron. And from that, uh, we, we had the plum pudding model, right? Where the plum pudding model is we have positive and negative charges just uh, dispersed in elements, which looked like a plum pudding. Uh, and then in 1911, Ernest Rutherford did the famous gold foil experiments. In this case, they had alpha particles shot out from a radioactive material to a thin AU foil. 99.99 something something percent of all the alpha, alpha particles went straight through. But every once in a while, some of them scattered away. And this led us to the uh, uh, Rutherford Bohr model of the atom, where we have a positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons, which was then subsequently modified with quantum mechanics to fall into discrete energy levels, which is the Bohr contribution to the Rutherford Bohr model, which is more or less what we work with today. And this was 1911. So all of atomic theory comes way, way, way after thermodynamics. But what we get typically in undergraduate thermo class is our goal is to teach undergraduate students just to accomplish some calculations. So we throw everything we've got at them. Right? We say, oh, this is why this is this way. And we use atomic theory, we rely heavily on it. But for this class, we're going to try and ignore as much of this as possible and focus just strictly on the mathematics of classical thermodynamics to transport us back into the 19th century to better understand why thermo is formulated the way that it is. All right. Any questions? I promise I won't go over it every class. All right, have a good week, and I will see you on Wednesday.